we know that the mind and a person's psychology can have a profound influence on our, our mitochondrial health as well. Uh, and you've done quite a bit of work. You've, you've done some, you've, you've published some really amazing research papers that I, I recommend people read. One's called An Energetic View of Stress, Focus on Mitochondria. Another one's called Psychological Stress and Mitochondria, a Conceptual Framework. Uh, and these are really well worth digging into for anybody listening who's uh, a health professional or just a science geek who's really interested in this topic. Um, so as you mentioned, mitochondrial psychobiology, this mind mitochondria link, and this kind of gets at the, the whole, you know, Descartes mind body dualism and the fact that, you know, we now know it's, it's pretty widely accepted, of course, that uh, it's very widely accepted that we know that the mind has a profound influence on the body. There's lots of lines of evidence that we can speak to about how psychological factors influence biological health more broadly and various kinds of diseases. Uh, and we know, for example, childhood trauma can greatly increase risk of, of diseases later on, in leave, uh, later on in life and many, many other aspects of this. So we know there's a link there. And yet despite that, there is this kind of blurriness of what exactly is that communication? How does our mind communicate with our body? What are these channels of communication? And I think your work has has uncovered uh, a really important aspect of that. So can, can you speak to that? So what is this mind mitochondria link all about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, so that's, that's probably my favorite topic. So, <laughs> so I appreciate uh, you know, uh, talking with you about this. The, the, uh, I would say exactly, you know, the mind body connection and, you know, just dissociating these as we know is a little artificial, right? <laughs> we, you know, as, as humans are really good to break things down into pieces. And that's maybe that's a whole point of analysis, right? To break down into pieces and all of our research methods are, are ways to break things down into, into little digestible pieces that we can understand and, you know, test mechanisms and all of that. But really, the whole system is an integrated system. And uh, as you say, you know, it's, there's well-documented effects, for example, of psychological stress on the immune system. And there were seminal studies done, you know, by uh, uh, the Kegel classers uh, who showed medical students during uh, exam periods, like at the end of the semester, who were super stressed out because um, they think their, their life is going to be done if, if they don't pass this exam, then they're more susceptible to infections. So they actually, if you um, expose them to, um, to certain, some stressors, Sheldon Cohen did studies like this where they would sequester people, stress them or not stress them, and then expose them to like a flu uh, virus in the nose and then showed that and when people are stressed, their, their immune system is down and they're more vulnerable to getting the cold and, uh, and, and to... Um, uh, to infections. And then the Kiko Classer showed that wound healing, you know, something as fundamental as if there's a, a wound on your skin or, you know, on your gum, uh, how quickly that wound heals, uh, which is also an integrated process. You need cells to, you know, kick in for in their proliferation. You need the immune system to come in, produce some cytokines and, you know, the blood flow needs to change and it's a, a whole organized uh, process. And they showed people when you're stressed and if you experimentally stress someone, that slows down wound healing, and it makes the person more vulnerable to infections. The immune system is modulated. Uh, so these are some of the you know uh, old seminal work. Uh, that's uh, I, I'm not sure if it's thought so much in medical school, but it's not part of of kind of the framework, the general biomedical framework. And what we think one of the reasons is is because we don't have a really good understanding of the basic. Um, molecular or biological mechanisms by which this happens right so there's the mind here you experience something there's a subjective experience which is very real right whatever is in your head <laughs> whatever we experience subjectively is very real to the person who's experiencing it and then there's these biological changes that happen in the immune system in the in the in the wound right or in the brain these are very real biological changes what's connecting these things right how do subjective experience uh, get translated in a language that the biology actually follows um, and then responds to. And our guiding hypothesis is that mitochondria and the flow of energy is that connection or that interface. Now, 
a quick question here. There, there's a lot of people out there who have conceptualized stress, psychological stress, and how it affects the body through different conceptual models. So, for example, you know, one of the most basic ones in, that's been around in the natural medicine community has been the adrenal fatigue model. And it's like stress is bad for you because it taxes the adrenals, which produce this stress hormone called cortisol. And if you do that too much, then it wears the adrenals out. Then you get low cortisol and that's what mediates all these negative effects. Okay. Then it was, you know, as people realized that that model was really way overly simplistic, a lot of people moved towards this HPA axis dysfunction model, which started to realize, Hey, there's a couple players upstream of the adrenals, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And those are really the key players. And so those are the most upstream things as far as what's sensing stress and mediating different effects in their body. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's other people out there, like there's a, a guy out there who specializes in chronic fatigue syndrome, who I've interviewed on this podcast named uh, Ashok Gupta, who really says, no, the, the hypothalamus and pituitary are not the most upstream thing. It's actually the limbic system and the amygdala that are the most upstream thing. And and then we have, you know, for example, there was an article, I believe it was in the Scientific American about some of your research with Douglas Wallace, where you guys, and I want to talk about some of the details of the study, but uh, you basically subjected people to stress and then you measured mitochondrial DNA in their blood. Uh, and I believe Douglas Wallace, I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but he said something to the effect of mitochondria are probably the most sensitive thing in the body. And so you could maybe make the case in this model that it's actually the mitochondria that are the most upstream thing before any, you know, sort of processing takes place in some of these brain centers. So what, what's your thoughts on how that should be conceptualized as far as what's the most upstream, most sensitive thing that is detecting the first immediate signals of what's going on in the environment? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so the work that you referred to was a work that was done in collaboration with uh, Anna Marsland and Brett Kaufman in Pittsburgh, which shows that psychological stress, if you expose someone to a psychological stress, you ask them to do, you know, to speak in front of a camera and then they feel stress and, and, and they feel a bit angry and <laughs> uncomfortable. We found that 30 minutes later, if you take blood and then you look in serum, there's more mitochondrial DNA that's released. And, uh, so that demonstrates the mitochondria somehow respond to, to that subjective experience and then respond by releasing the mitochondrial genome. And, you know, Doug uh, is, is fantastic and he commented on this study. Um, and that's his view, right? That the mitochondria are the most sensitive thing in the body. I tend to agree. And I imagine that it's because, you know, everything in the organism, you know, from just being alive <laughs> requires a flow of energy. And anything that is stressful, and by definition, you know, something that's stressful is something that perturbs us, right? Something that is uh, not stressful and then doesn't elicit anything in the in the organism, and it's it's very hard to not be stressed or influenced by anything. I think you, if you're dead, you know, if if there is no flow of energy in the body, <laughs> and the the body is not animated by energy anymore then the body cannot respond to, you know, to a stressor. But we respond to just a little word. Right? Someone says one word and that can trigger a whole kind of cascade. The heart starts to beat faster. Hormones are released. Blood pressure increases. Uh, you know, we get warmer. The body actually gets warmer uh, when, when we're stressed. Uh, so there are all of these changes. Every little bit of the stress response. Uh, from increasing heart rate or blood pressure to producing an, a new uh, hormone or releasing a hormone, every little bit requires energy. So there's there's nothing in the body that moves or that changes that doesn't require energy. So because energy is so cent central to every little part of the stress response, all the, you know from the single gene to the whole person, we think energy is uh, you know most likely one of the first thing to change when there is stress. Um, and then because energy flows mainly in the mitochondria in, in human beings and in, you know, complex animals, then mitochondria must be one of the first places to actually perceive, to have the ability to perceive that change in energy flux, um, and, uh, and then respond to that. So, and there's mitochondria everywhere, you know, the, the three models that you mentioned, the adrenal fatigue, the HP axis and the limbic amygdala, you know, models, I think these overlap in different ways. And, you know, there's mitochondria everywhere in, in the amygdala, <laughs> in the hypothalamus and uh, thalamus and the 
uh, pituitary gland and the, and, the, and the adrenal glands. And what's remarkable is that, you know, the stress hormones, most people will know about cortisol, which is made in the adrenal glands. Well, where in the adrenal glands is cortisol being made? Okay. Mm-hmm. It's actually in the mitochondria. So the, every stress hormone and every also sex hormones, uh, all of these hormones that are derived from uh, cholesterol, they're called steroid hormones, they're all made in the mitochondria. Um, so the, for some evolutionary reason, the body thought it was a good idea to you know, put the synthesis of one of the most important family of hormones, the sex hormones that define, you know, uh, female from male and the, the stress hormones that allow us to survive uh, different events, you know, throughout life, those are actually synthesized in, in the organelle that sustains energy. So there's not really a good, um, you know, we can speculate as to why that is, but from our view, I think it's, it's a good illustration of how tightly knit those things are, the stress response and the, the energetic um, capacity of, of the organism. Yeah. Now, what it's sort of big picture, what is this signaling all about? So we know that psychological stress, what's going on in the mind, affects mitochondria, can cause mitochondrial dysfunction, can cause the contents of mitochondria, whether it's the DNA, whether it's purines like ATP and ADP, to leak out of the cell into the bloodstream where it's doing some sort of signaling. What is this all about? What is, what is this signaling actually trying to accomplish? Like from an evolutionary perspective, why are our bodies designed this way? What good is it actually doing? Mm-hmm. One way to think about it is not as, um, you know, a purely kind of dysfunctional system, like stress is bad, it causes these molecules and then that causes disease. But, uh, you know, not all stress causes disease, right? And, you know, I think many people will relate to stress being actually a pretty stimulating thing, right? And, and if you have zero stress, you know, some people need quite a bit of stress to actually get something done. <laughs> uh, and, you know, with stress can come motivation and, and some other things. There's, uh, you know, Bruce uh, McEwen likes to call it toxic stress when it's, and it's not good anymore. But, you know, all of this stuff before toxic stress can actually stimulate, uh, you know, healing and stimulate adaptation and, and you know, uh, uh, strength of, of different um, functions um, and actually bolster the organism's health and resistance yes, disease yes. And longevity yeah and you mentioned the hormesis uh, earlier right that's the, that idea there's little stressors will stimulate processes in the body that if those if that stress persists that can become damaging but if it's acute like you go to the gym for an hour or you know you walk up the stairs instead of taking the elevator that will stimulate things in your legs and in your heart and in your brain. And, and then, you know, your body will become a little stronger, uh, you know, as a result. Um, so that's hormesis uh, that the body adapting to challenge or, or to stress and then becoming stronger as a result. Um, so I think the, the different processes you were mentioning, um, we see as, as communication, why, you know, why would mitochondria release all of these things? Uh, we think it's the same reason as, you know, why do people talk to each other? Right. Cause, cause that's how things need to work. You know, why do different organs in the body talk to each other? Why do the different organs are connected with our, a cardiovascular system through blood? Yeah. Information needs to be exchanged. I think it's a basic property of, of life. Um, and, and that's how complex systems you know, function and, and operate. That's how um, things, uh, living organisms fight entropy. <laughs> you know, to remain healthy is to go against the, um, you know, the, the forces of physics. You know, if, if, if we were subject to the forces of physics and we didn't have energy flow to, to resist that, then we would just decay, right? We manage to, uh, to go against that and to go against just dissipation of, of matter for, you know, 80, 100 years uh, because of the flow of energy and because, you know, there's communication. So the, um, it's a bit similar if we were to look at the brain from a, a primitive, you know, view, like, I don't know how, how, how long ago, like a, a century ago, and we say, oh, you know, when you, when you stress the brain 
through the eye. So that would be like stimulating something from the eye of an animal, let's say. And then, you know, there's all of these chemicals being released uh, in the back part of the brain, the occipital region where the visual information is processed. And there's like GABA and serotonin and like dopamine and these things, you know, would be released. Then you would say, oh, you like, this must be dysfunctional. But then, you know, in hindsight, it's like, no, this is neurons need to talk to each other to make sense of the information that's coming in. And that stress, that perturbation that's coming in is actually meaningful information if you can decode it. So in order for the system to decode it, make sense of it, and then mount an intelligent response that will allow the organism and the system to, to remain alive and to remain healthy and to adapt to it, there needs to be communication, right? That's how complex networks and complex uh, systems work and, and uh, process information and, and adapt. So I think that's how we see those signals that mitochondria release. If you look at it simplistically, you say mitochondrial DNA release, bad, triggers inflammation, bad. You say mitochondria release these molecules, it has multiple effects. We've looked at one thing, inflammation, yes. <laughs> inflammation can be bad, but inflammation is also important for the adaptation of, of the adaptive processes and, and so on. So I think the, the overly simplistic explanation or interpretation comes from our lack of sufficient knowledge and uh, maybe the, the simplicity, or, uh, simplicity of our minds. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.